Good afternoon. Nice to see you all. So um, we're delighted to have here today the distinguished uh, British writer David Campany uh, in discussion with the curator of Dream Locations, Stephen Waddell. Uh, um, following this conversation, please join us upstairs on the third floor for a book signing, and also it's the last day of the exhibition. It's also, David will be giving a lecture uh, at Emily Carr on Tuesday, uh, entitled uh, "Between Photography Between Page and Wall, and that's, uh, did I already say that? 7.30, yes, on Tuesday, uh, and it's open to everyone. Uh, I'd really like to thank David for his generosity in coming over uh, uh, in a very, he has a very busy schedule and he's crossed the pond to be with us on this occasion. I'd also like to uh, extend my thanks to Stephen Waddell who brought a lot of uh, perseverance and insight to putting this exhibition together and also Emily Carr, uh, the photography department for uh, their collaboration. David Campany has made uh, significant contributions to understanding of photography, not only as an art form, but also as, it, as its central role in, in culture in general. His expansive writings about documentary, art, film, fashion, architecture, and archives has substantiated the medium's wide significance. He has opened up the discourses of photography with uh, publications such as Art and Photography, a survey of um, the importance of photography in contemporary art since 1960 that was published in 2003 and his 2008 book on uh, photography and cinema. Uh, and most recently he's also uh, produced a book as well as an exhibition on uh, the magazine work of Walker Evans. David's also an artist and a curator, uh, and teaches photography and theory at Westminster University in London. He uh, won the International Center of Photography's Infinity Award for his writings in 2013. Stephen Waddell uh, is a Vancouver artist who, while he began uh, studying painting, uh, has moved towards photography and film. His recent work explores connections between painting and or painterly gesture and depictive realism and thus you can see that influence I would say in the exhibition. He's shown throughout North America and Europe, is in important collections. Uh, he's represented by Monty Clark Gallery and he also teaches uh, at Emily Carr University. His monograph published by Steidel in uh, 2011 is available in our bookstore as well. So um, let's let's get underway. And uh, if you have uh, burning questions, you can you can interrupt. But uh, maybe most of the questions will be uh, left to the end. So, gentlemen, please join me in welcoming David. Well, uh, thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to thank David for coming from London. Um, a, a big pleasure for me, but also a long way for him. So I appreciate his generosity, as Helga said. I'd like to thank Reed and Helga for the support for this show, um, which was, uh, as you said, hard fought, and, and a lot of support it took to make the show. And I'm glad to have done it. Um, I think that David and I, we discussed last night talking for about an hour, and then perhaps questions after that. Maybe I'll start by just describing roughly speaking, what this show uh, purports to be about. Um, so here's just an image of something you've already just seen uh, upstairs. Uh, this exhibition started um, anecdotally uh, through a conversation with David, um, such that a few years ago we were looking at uh, Walker Evans photos in magazines in his library in London, and it suddenly struck me, even though I'd seen the magazine work, that David um, was making apparent for me the, the, the art inside of, of the Walker Evans 
magazine work that I'd not appreciated before. And then suddenly it occurred to me a year and a half later, in conversation with Helga, that the idea of a show could come out of, out of this, these ideas I had about Walker Evans in terms of the experimental nature of his work at some point between 1938 and 41, um, where in, maybe in the magazine work and maybe just in, in the idea of going down into the subway and making these photographs um, that Walker Evans was trying to uh, provisionally release himself from a kind of modernism, a kind of um, journalism that he had helped to shape but that um, maybe for him um, he wanted to see hybridized or changed in such a way that he could free himself from being only um, <clears throat> related to one, one way of working. So from that point forward, uh, being an artist that appealed to me, the idea that these pictures he took, he did not exhibit them, he tried to publish them uh, on a few occasions, like David just told me last night, he tried to um, come up with a series of edits, but that not in maybe until the Bizarre Magazine um, intervention, um, that maybe the true poetry, maybe in combination with the, the design of the magazine that at that moment, but that the true poetry of the project, unfinished, I would say it's an unfinished project, um, was revealed and such that its provisional nature for me is forever intact mainly because of the way it was, it was exhibited and, uh, and not exhibited, excuse me, and, and then released to the magazine world. Um, so from that point forward I thought, well, what if I could find other artworks um, that could speak to this provisional nature in the Evans and in in this kind of modernist photographic idiom um, but then speak to their own interiority or their own practices that they were trying to um, substantiate, tear apart, um, make voids inside of their practice, whatever. So it could be Sigmar Polka, <clears throat> Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, and uh, Gerhard Richter, of course, his, his use of photography being very important in, in terms of the history of painting since 1960. So I thought, what if I could take a kind of a painterly approach, yet keep it distinctly about things in photography that I find aesthetically interesting, but also have some theoretical and some historical relationships um, that I find also interesting and not just aesthetic. So then the show evolved forward in such a way that I wanted to show things that I just liked as well. So the Runa Islam projection piece is just a, is, a, is an artwork that is an allegorical um, piece about maybe obsolescence, maybe about photography, maybe about technique, maybe about the darkroom, maybe about the studio, but it's just a beautiful, a beautiful artwork. And so I, I, I started to move on and want to put things that I felt were very um, handsome together to find another word um, is going to be hard for the second. But so then the, the Sigmar polkas are green, so we have contrasting colors. And then um, I wanted to interject another conversation in the show, and that would be photography that comes notionally speaking from from artists who, who probably don't have a, a similar investment to photography in the way that Walker Evans would and that would be the Elad Lazari um, similar to other artists uh, working in contemporary art like Christopher Williams Roe Etheridge and, 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 and a few others, maybe Lucas Blaylock such that this other conversation about photography um, and we talked about this last night David, was that it, it maybe makes a different claim for what it's doing or, or, or its intentionality. Mm -hmm. So that, roughly speaking, is about putting these artworks together to see if those conversations could um, <clears throat> create some other dialogue other than the, um, what should we call it, the kind of hysterical um, conversations that are kind of uh, put forward by certain people in, in, in photography conversations around the planet at the moment. Yeah. So um, that's, roughly speaking, the, the show. Um, I guess for me, what we were talking about last night, which I kind of enjoyed, was speaking about the artistic document and maybe its duality, its life. Um, mm. And maybe this show is also about that, that the document itself um, is not surrendered because it's, it's necessarily started from a more painterly purpose, say, in, in the hands of Polka, that for Polka it depends upon the document very much, um, that he made images of uranium uh, does not and that they, that they appear as abstractions because there is maybe no other way for them to appear, but that they are dependent on the document. I think the entire show, in some way, um, may reveal this duality of the life of a document. Yeah, yeah my, feeling about, um, my feeling about photography is that it, 
Um, it endures in ways uh, that, are, that are particular to the medium be because of its relation to the document. And you know, documents are peculiar things because they, they, still need, they still need explaining or they still need, they still need a context which may not be there. So photographs have a way of sort of outliving themselves. Um, and at the same time, uh, I think every time anyone engages with photography, they, they are aware that um, art doesn't own it. It kind of, kind of borrows it. Um, I mean, if you're a painter, you own pretty much only work within art. Uh, but if you're a, if you're a photographer, uh, it, it's a medium that's, that's everywhere and was, was everywhere almost immediately after its invention. And uh, those, dial those dialogues never go away. You know, so it's, n it's nice to see a show where you have things made with a very strong and definite claim to art things with a much weaker claim to art. Um, but they all claim to be interesting photography or interesting about photography. The question of obsolescence, I think, is, is really fascinating because you know, people have talked about the obsolescence of photography uh, pretty much since the invention of cinema, that you know, one thing or another <coughs> displaced photography, whether it was cinema or whether it was television or whether it was the internet or whether it was the, you know, the becoming electronic of the image. Um, it's had a long history of being you know, kind of battered about and sidelined. And I, I, I think most practitioners are either implicitly or explicitly aware of all of these questions. I'm saying it in a very highfalutin way, but I think, I think to even pick up the camera, you're you're a little bit aware of those kinds of uh, condition. The interesting thing about the those Evans pictures that are in the vitrine, the Harper's Bazaar pictures, come in. Thanks. I shall pause. Can everyone hear all right? No. no. You can't hear. Even louder. <laughs> Don't worry, I haven't said anything interesting at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, that seems better. I kind of feel like I could invade Poland or something with this. Crimea. Yeah, Crimea. Um, the, the, the Evans pictures are very interesting and what Stephen said about the those subway pictures being an unfinished project is is really fascinating because uh, you may or may not know that they were Evans took those in, in 1938 and 1940 and they weren't published for a long time they were first published in the middle middle of the 1950s in a tiny little academic journal on the occasion of the death of Evans's friend James Agee. In fact, I think I can, I think I can show you those. And, it, and it's a completely different edit of the pictures, and it's a completely different cropping of the pictures. And this was already 15, 17 years after they were made. And Evans was really fascinated in the idea that you that you might photograph the, the present with with posterity in mind, because a, a, a photograph when it's is only contemporary for a very very short time, and then it takes on um, another kind of life, and that means that the, whatever dimension of the picture is, is document or documentary. Um, goes through this kind of very complex uh, you know, series of transformations. Most of the time, just disappearance, just plain. Most photographs disappear. Um, but part of what the, the unfinished part, which I like 
is is the fact, and something you mentioned last night is, do you show all of them or do you just show some of them? And that's also a question that um, I find interesting because obviously Walker Evans, one part of his personality would say, I just show some of them because these are these are the the select shots that exhibit more of what I was thinking about. And then, yeah. so then last night you said, well, what what why not just show all of them? And so, Stephen, yeah. yeah, sorry. So that so the question is, if you do show all of them, do you do you alter the the project, or is it is it allowed? To have, are you allowed to show all of them? Does that mean the same thing? But I, I have a feeling that Walker Evans probably was interested in showing um, different groups at different times. So that's even more confusing. But what I am interested in is that I think there were a few uh, pictures for him that said something uh, about the project others wouldn't. For instance, the, the man on the left there is you know, the, the looked over person that, that nobody really sees who exists but is merely a gray moving shape. Um, and then some of the other pictures uh, obviously become iconic because of the gaze. So I think that there's, there was artistic procedures he was playing with that were um, maybe inside of the photojournalistic language, but then were becoming um, a new kind of artistic model that he was playing with. And I think he probably left it unfinished because it didn't fit, fit with his um, proto-filmic 20s and 30s realism that, that in fact, um, you know, he and Ed, uh, you know, James Aggie were not going to change the world with their photography and, and combination. And that <clears throat> this, this probably had a way to change things um, in the way that even the, the the earlier photographs didn't, but that's just coming as speaking as an artist, not speaking as someone who's who's you know completely entrenched in in, in the mandate of twenties and thirties realism, for instance. Yeah. Um, whenever he photographed uh, people, um, he was Evan starts making work in the in the twenties and thirties where. You know, it's the first real expansion of the mass media, and um, everyone is being reduced to an image. You know, whether it's your photo, you know, driver's ID, or the, the fact that the mass media is full of kind of branded images of, of individuals. And Evans was extremely aware of this problem, and even even in his text, I mean, he wrote the little texts that you see on the pages as well, several times, you know, he'd redraft them. And um, he says something like the, um, you know, the, cru the rude imposition of the camera has been partially softened by, you know, in a, an elapsing of time. Because even when these pictures were published, they were old. So they were kind of doubly out of context. You've got, you've got pictures of, uh, you know, anonymous subway passengers that he manages to get published in essentially a fashion magazine. Um, and then there, uh, then there's this whole idea that, you know, that, that the subway might be another kind of studio that's not, that's not the fashion studio. It's a, it's a very complex thing, but I think the question of how, how photography gets finished <laughs> is, is really difficult because as soon as you uh, as soon as you begin a, a, a photographic project that's more than a single picture, you're, you've then got a question of number and uh, like what is what what's an appropriate number? I mean, how how many of how many of those overpainted photographs do, does Gerhard Richter need to make? Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, keeps keeps making them as far as I know. And, and Evans photographs 400, 500 people on the subway. Um, yeah, he tries to make a book, first of all, and it doesn't get published. Then he sort of lets the project rest. Um, time is passing. The, the fact that he can't resolve this project is, is really fascinating, I think, because it's to, do with, it's to do with photography coming into a dialogue with um, a very provisional world. You know, you've got subway passengers, they come in, they sit down, uh, they may be photographed, they may not. Evans goes away with his hall. Um, and it, you know, it end, the project seems to endlessly churn for him. He also did, made a book of it finally, finally in 1966 with another title called Many Are Called. Um, 
But I, I take that churning as a, as a very interesting symptom of um, photography's sort of historical disposition and that relation to its afterlife. We've, we've no idea on what basis photographs survive, even photographs that are, are made with a kind of strong artistic claim. It may still be their documentary value that we see years later. I mean, I feel this when I look at works of conceptual art. They didn't mean to be documenting um, the facial hair of bohemian artists around 1970, but those pictures do do that. You know, and I, I look at them and I just think, wow, that's what Victor Bergen looked like. Uh, as, as well as everything else. You know, and that's, you can't avoid that in photography. You can't avoid that at all. You know, when I, last time I was here, um, Jeff Wall drove me down the street where he shot Mimic, you know, the, shot three people on the street. And the street hadn't, really hadn't changed. But you'd never find people wearing precisely those clothes and that woman in those kind of hot pants. Um, so whatever else that photograph is, is a, it's a document mm -hmm. too. And that's, that's really subversive, I think, of, of artistic intent. So, I mean, that subversion, I think, is interesting because if, for instance, um, we, you know, we, we were talking about um, certain behaviors that <clears throat> seem to show up in, in photographic practices or in artistic practices. For instance, um, appropriation, the use of an archive um, as, it, as it unfolds today, not just how it's unfolded. Um, and then trying to think about maybe how Elad Lazary or Christopher Williams are not necessarily appropriating images, although they might be appropriating an image, but they, they're appropriating a, a gesture or behavior in order to, um, as you say, make a claim to be art. So that, so that appropriation process is their subversion. And, but I guess what you were saying, and in a way I, I find it true, is if, if the documentary feature of a photograph as long as it's based on a kind of representational index, of course, will will eventually come out. And yes, all these things do end up looking like um, pure documents. I see it in my own photographs that even in a few short years, things already look different. So that documentary nature, though, is interesting because at the moment, um, a lot of conversations about photography are about the the transpiring of that that process. And you know, in terms of for me, realism is not going away, and no amount of abstraction and distraction with abstraction will um, take us far enough away that we will find a whole other group of, of subsets of and approaches to photography that we have come you know, accustomed to. It's not just modernist idioms, um, it is the, the hybridizing of those modernist idioms that, that I think we're witnessing. Um, I don't even think we're seeing uh, things made very far from modernism even now. But so that subversion of the document, um, for instance, you asked me last night, name a historical work of photography that I felt only um, was important as art and not as, uh, you know, a document. Yeah. And I mentioned Atje. And so, so Eugene Atje to me is like one of the most subversive of this, <clears throat> what we could say is, is, the, is the pure um, photographic pre-modern, modern form, um, bridging this gap between painting and and, um, and photography, where you can see that Wark Evans is much more switched on than Atje in a way. So, but but builds a, a larger, more subversive program. Um, so, I guess my question for you is: after that question last night, do you do you still feel that there is always a document? There's always some notion of photography that 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 is not necessarily um, a claim for art in something that you would see or something you can recall or think about. Um, yeah, that's, that, no, yes, I would be the short answer. I do, I do feel that. Well, then I'm sure that's up for, up for debate and people have all kinds of opinions about that. The interesting thing about, you know, the sort of, the way that art sort of cannibalizes and hybridizes um, photographic practices from, from outside of itself. Um, that, that's always, I think that's always gone on, at least, at least for 100 years. 
um, that. But that's to, but that's to say ph that. Photographies, <coughs> I mean, in, in the opening statement that you didn't hear because I had a mic, didn't have a microphone, I was trying to suggest that you know, it's impossible to pursue photography as art without kind of looking over your shoulder to the stuff that's not. It's always in dialogue with it. You know, it's the kind of, non-art is the kind of black backing of the mirror that makes the mirror work. Um, I, don't, I, don't think there is, I don't think there is a pure art photography. I'm not, I'm not sure what that would be. Um, so that's, that's always gone on. Photography is always, you know, hybridizing, appropriating, you know, mimicking other forms. But maybe my position on this is different from yours because I, I, I do come to photography as someone who's fascinated in photography first and, and art second. So that when I see Elad Lazary um, appropriating a certain kind of language from you know, commercial portraiture, oh, well, I'm someone who's just interested in commercial portraiture as well. And I don't necessarily need Elad Lassery to be uh, <laughs> making his artistic gesture with it. Uh, I mean, if, 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 I was, if I was a plumber, I wouldn't have been that interested in Marcel Duchamp's appropriation of a uh, urinal. <laughs> you know? I'd be like, well, what's the big deal? You know? well, so, uh, and I, I do feel like that about photography. You know, somebody, somebody appropriates the language of mid-century press photography, let's say. Uh, I don't find that any more or less interesting, um, thank you, uh, than mid-century press photography. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need somebody doing it in the name of art for me to be really fascinated by it. And if you, I mean, the interesting thing about Evans, I'm, I'm slightly uh, uh, not keeping my powder dry here because I'm <laughs> going to talk about Evans at the, at the Emily Carr talk. But you know, Evans said there are four. There are, just, there are four ways for a photographer to earn a living, it's, and it's really sobering. Okay, listen carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. You're independently wealthy to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> For example, Alfred Stieglitz, mm. who he detested. <laughs> Number two, you are, you're paid to take pictures. Somebody needs a picture taken, you take it, and you take it with whatever independence, autonomy, integrity, creativity, or not, that you can muster. Number three, you take whatever pictures the hell you like, and somebody might pay you for them, like an artist. Now, Evans died in 75, so it was only just possible. And, you know, people came knocking to buy prints. Um, or your photography is your serious pastime or hobby, and you earn your money elsewhere. You might, you might be a plumber or an electrician or a carpenter or a teacher, whatever. But, but that's it. That's it or a combination thereof. And that casts a very, very different light on the history of photography. Because you know, we have this thing called a history of photography, capital H, capital P, and you kind, you kind of imagine that all of those photographers that you see in the history of photography were making that work in the name or in the pursuit of the, <laughs> some kind of history of photography. And a lot, a lot of them weren't, or they only had kind of half an eye on it, maybe. Um, and again, that's, that's a really fascinating issue. Because uh, uh, on the one hand, look, here, here you have a magazine, and I would, I would, think, of, would think of this as realism in a, a documentary in an, in an expanded and experimental sense. And yet it's made for a medium that <coughs> is destined to be thrown away, you know, a, a magazine, unless someone like you or I comes along and rescues it. But I wouldn't want it rescued in the name of art. I, want, I would want it rescued because it's just really good photography and it's a really interesting way to work. So and that's, what, that's what happens, I think, when, you, when in a very odd way you have a commitment to something like photography, which I feel I do. The art bit 
the art bit comes and goes. It certainly doesn't have a monopoly on what's good or interesting about photography. I'm not trying to diss it, but it's just not, it doesn't have the monopoly. 